All right, welcome everyone. Whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening for you, this is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. And um, welcome to OE Global. This is the first day of the conference and it's been pretty exciting so far. And um, you're in the Regional Leaders of Open Education session on shared challenges and shared solutions. And I wanna introduce my panelists um, and I'm going to start with um, Amy Hofer, who is the coordinator of Open Oregon Educational Resources. Um, would you like to say hi, Amy? Hi, I'm uh, here from Portland, Oregon, um, with Open Oregon Educational Resources, and I'm joined by my work group member, Sunny. Do you want to turn on your microphone and say hello also? Yes. Hello. Hi from Honolulu, Hawaii. <laughs> Oh boy, I wish I could be there. Thank you very much, Amy and Sunny. And next up is Dr. Denise Cote from the Windy City, Chicago. Hi everyone, Denise Cote. I'm from the College DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois, and I'm a librarian. Thank you for coming today. Wonderful. Next up is James Glapa Grossclegg, who's a Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources and Distance Learning. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, greetings from the Los Angeles area and College of the Canyons, which is one of the California community colleges. And last but not least, the amazing Quill West, uh, who is Open Education Project Manager at Pierce College in Washington. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, and it's lovely to talk to you from the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Wonderful. All right. So, um, I'm going to give you a little introduction um, and then we're going to jump into the overviews of the work groups. Everyone's going to spend about four minutes on this um, so that we can uh, get you into breakout rooms that you'll be able to choose which breakout room you want to go to um, to discuss the four topics policy, professionalism, stewardship, and sustainability. Then we'll come back together, share some of that feedback, and talk about um, uh, wish lists for phase two. So a little bit of history. Um, we started this at the Open Education Conference last year in 2019, actually in person in Phoenix, Arizona. And it was um, bringing together um, uh, colleges, universities, library consortia, and government agencies, so our regional compacts, who are all involved in open education right now. Um, and want to work together to collaborate across their boundaries, both institutional and state boundaries, um, and really share solutions that work um, and eliminate, eliminate duplicate efforts and duplicate kind of research. I'm sorry, my slides are a little out of um, order today. Um, here was our, here was our uh, time, timeline for um, the project. Um, as I mentioned, it was launched back in October of 2019. There was a lot of uh, work group meetings. Those four work groups were uh, working very, uh, very uh, diligently on their four areas. Um, then we had a, pr a presentation, a public presentation at Open Ed Week, uh, more meetings um, of individual work groups. And then in June, we had um, a coming together of multiple um, OER um, leadership groups. Uh, we had both the Doers, the Florida Virtual Campus, and we also had um, WCET, which is part of um, the regional compacts, um, come together and talk about how we could collaborate. And then we continued to work um, over the summer and now we're presenting the outcomes of um, year one. And we'll, uh, we are hoping to uh, hear from you about um, what you would like to see um, as we move into the future. And <laughs> back to my beautiful slide about the call for collaboration. And I do apologize that this is out of order. Um, the open education movement is really been around about 20 years in its current incarnation. And it's moving out of being just a movement into really a professional field. And so when we started thinking about this in spring of 2019, um, we realized uh, that there was really a need to come together and, um, and plan for this future professional field, which is 
which is really on it, upon us now. And so we identified those four areas, which was policy, professionalism, stewardship, and sustainability. And I'm not gonna go into that, any details about that because um, coming up next will be um, each of our work group leaders who will speak to those mm -hmm. areas. So I'm gonna turn it over to Amy and Sunny. Thanks, Una. So, um... I'm going to talk a little bit about the work of the sustainability work group. And if you go to the next slide, um, you can see all the members of the work group. And um, this was a really um, exciting group to collaborate with. Um, and I'm really grateful for all the contributions that the work group members made. Um, so um, the, the sustainability work group um, I'll just admit that um, the word sustainability, I've, I've had mixed experiences with that word. I've found that some people that I've worked with have said, um, you know, yes, but is it sustainable? And when they say that, they mean, um, no, we can't pursue this exciting project. It's sort of like a way to um, shut the door on an idea. Um, and so the work group started with a definition of sustainability from David Wiley, sustainability will be defined as an open educational resource project's ongoing ability to meet its goals. And we really like this definition um, because it is really flexible depending on your context and your goals and what you are trying to achieve. Sustainability might look very different depending on your own environment. Um, so let's go on to um, the next slide. Um, and I think this is where I hand it over to my colleague, Sunny. Okay, thank you. So we, um, we first started off with um, identifying stakeholders um, as uh, um, existing institutional positions and personnel who are impacted in any way by OER. Um, it was a little bit more granular than uh, categories such as instructors and administrators, more to the level of curriculum coordinator or academic advisor, and each stakeholder becomes a potential partner. Uh, we developed a spreadsheet and uh, filled it with practices that show how OER advocacy behaviors can be embedded into the institution, and we sorted them into larger um, categories, which Amy will show in the next slide. And uh, then once we generated this list, we looked for gaps in our knowledge. Take it away, Amy. So um, the categories that we used were based on a guide um, created at SUNY. And um, there's a link in the slide um, to the really excellent sustainability toolkit that they shared. So we, we didn't want to recreate the wheel. We wanted to build on um, with the existing work that they had already done. So we used their categories um, and we looked for examples of where open education um, was already being integrated into processes and workflows in our institutions within each category. Um, and this um, led to our creating a kind of a filing cabinet of a spreadsheet. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so um, after gathering our resources, um, the team asked, what are we missing and what are exemplars for this approach? Um, and then um, Amy set about pulling these data points together into a narrative um, entitled the um, RLO uh, Sustainability Guide, which includes a lot of links to many published resources. Um, the guide highlights communication strategies, including key engagements, for an OER advocate to initiate with stakeholders. And one of the things that uh, we found out was that um, the uh, Commission for Higher Education Accreditation is, um, um, they have a new commissioner. They put out a call for um, um, academic standards that address diversity and uh, equity. And um, uh, I attended a California Accreditation Commission talk about this. So here's, this is an angle that might be very important to our institutions. Every academic year has repeated and predictable activities, such as student advising and the publishing of the class schedule. Understanding um, that institution has uh, different academic calendars, um, quarter versus semester, we set up a timeline Gantt chart 
to serve as a template of reminders and um, uh, to serve as, uh, yeah, so when certain actions should take place. Uh, we include a discussion of how students can be a part of this and a discussion of how a sustainable and tactical approach to assessment can help gauge the growth of adoption at your institution. We sincerely hope that you'll find something that can help you with your work. Uh, thank you. That's it for our sustainability group. Great. Thank you so much, Sunny and Amy, for um, that overview. And next up is Quill West uh, speaking about professionalism of the open educator. Hello, everybody. Oh. Okay, there we go. Um, I am really excited to be here to talk about some of the work we did with Arlo in professionalism. And I'm gonna go ahead and ask that we just shift to the next slide so everybody can see who my wonderful supportive work group were. Um, this, <laughs> the professionalism group grew and changed and shrunk and then grew again over the course of this project, partially because what we wanted to do was so ambitious. Um, and so um, go ahead and go to the next slide for me, please. Um, so a big reason why Arlo wanted to focus on this idea of professionalism is because we recognize that regional leaders are often responsible for directing um, people to ideas and ways to get training. Um, and so we wanted to find out, first of all, what does it mean to be a professional in our field? What resources exist to help people become professionals in our field? Um, and then um, how can we support that work or how can we help um, regional leaders find and and access training and give people ideas about it. So that started our questions. Um, and in our first meeting, we quickly moved from what are competencies to what are roles in professional development. Um, and, and I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so we decided to identify roles of open education professionals. What do, what do people do in this work? Um, how do they, what do the people who do, how, who have these positions do every day? Um, and then examine professional development opportunities, both to do a, a kind of assessment, a gap assessment, what's missing, what's not there, but also to do um, kind of provide a guide. So, um, an example of what this might look like, if we'll go to the next one, is, um, oh, <laughs> there were some resources we worked with and I wanna make sure that we recognize them. So Salt Lake Community College had developed this incredible set of position descriptions of librarians across the open education space. So we started by looking at that. So it made it a lot easier to go, this is what librarians do <laughs> because we had job descriptions, but that doesn't happen in a lot of the other spaces that people work in open education because a lot of people were hired and then took on open education instead of having it being their their job. Um, so we did a lot of brainstorming as a group um, and we did use the UNESCO Open Education Resources Competency Framework so those are all great resources um, that went into building this incredible tool that I'm going to, or this hopefully incredible tool that people will use that I'm popping into the chat window right now. Um, if you'll go ahead and move forward for me. Um, here's a sample of how that works. So we thought up all these competencies described in a variety of different ways, depending on the field that you work in. And then we used, um, basically a controlled vocabulary approach for the librarians in the room to try to find what are the overarching competency ideas and then broke those down. So um, if you're an instructional designer, the main things that you might do working with open education um, have to do with having a working knowledge of information um, of people's intellectual property rights. Although it's a working knowledge, you don't have to have the in-depth knowledge that maybe a scholarly publishing librarian needs to have. Um, and then moving around this circle, you can see where things intersect. Um, and the idea here then is if I want to be an instructional designer in the open education space, what skills do I need to find above and beyond what I've already trained in as an instructional designer? And then how do I find those? So that'll be the next step in our project is really vetting <laughs> um, professional development opportunities and directing people to them. Um, so I'm going to, um, 
I've already given you the link to the Open Education Professionalism Matrix as it stands right now. Um, our next steps really need to be about pri prioritizing the skills and um, mapping the existing training opportunities to the skill sets we've identified. So that's some of the work we're working on right now. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Quill. And we are on to uh, Dr. Denise Cote to speak about policy and strategy. Hi, everyone. I'm going to keep my camera off because my internet is sketchy, so I don't want to tax it any more than I really need to. Sorry. Um, so um, go to the next slide, please. Policy and strategy. This was really fun. Um, we had a very large working group, and as you can see, a lot of these people are um, at the state level, they work in at boards of higher education, their leaders have regional consortia, their state leaders. So the next slide, we um, discussed our common issue of not being able to really pin down how state open education leaders were implementing legislation and state policy. So um, we'd see the outcomes of their labor like publicly available reports from like say statewide committees, websites that serve state and regional efforts, course marking and stuff like that. But the question was, how did they get there? So how did they, um, you know, what was their best practices around mandated and hopefully appropriated textbook affordability and quality initiatives? So, um, and we knew that we could benefit at the global level. So. At the same time, if you go to the next slide, um, the OER world map um, group made a call for policies to be added to the world map database. So, and then they were also at the same time embarking on an initiative to create like this standalone scoping or like an entrance point just for po the policy section of this gigantic database. So we did a lot of prep. Um, we studied the master spec for the database. Um, we um, met with the leadership of the group um, several times. We met with Spark. We met with the Doers Group. Um, we met with the Hewlett Foundation. And then we decided to throw our lot in with the hub and work on building out that database with United States policies and documents. Um, I think you can go to the next slide. Yeah, with the view that we would create a repository um, that would help practitioners, but also be a source of development um, for best practices and a place to do research on open education policy in the United States and, and in the world and, and to make those comparisons. So um, we started looking at all the records and trying to develop um, common language. And we did a pilot with, um, well, we're trying to do a pilot. We've done two states. Um, we'd like to get two more states to put in their documents. So, um, and then we wanna try and refine and align those database entries using common vocabulary, a common taxonomy. Um, and then also, of course, sticking with the master spec of the database. So the next steps for us um, is to finish the pilot, um, have three or four states that have all of their documents in and um, create job aids and to help people put in their documents. Um, and I'm finding that it's easier for um, people who are participating to have someone working with them to get their documents in. So I've worked with Colorado, I've worked with Texas, I'm currently working with North Dakota. And hopefully I'm gonna try and um, tame the beast of California and get some of their stuff in. Uh, California is just a lot. So anyway, um, but it would be great to have some California documentation and then widely promote participation in this project. Um, to keep the database up to date and fully fleshed out so it can be a really good resource for people that are either like me embarking on state legislation and, and policies or people that want to do research. And um, of course, it's very important to keep it up to date. So um, this is an example of a record. Um, and this is exciting and, you know, for the librarians in the room, um, you're probably really excited about this, but um, this is a record for a piece of legislation from the state of Texas. So it, it describes what is in this legislation. 
But if you see on the right, it's the basis for all of these other entries in the database. So this legislation appropriated for a feasibility study. And then they put in um, how they did their rulemaking around um, creating a task force that was mandated, a grant program that was mandated, um, and then the program rules. So it's a really nice way to, you know, you go to a record, you've got legislation, and then you have all these associated documents that, that are addressed by this legislation. So um, yeah, it is a big project, but um, it could be something that would be um, an extremely useful tool for the United States, but also for other countries. And we can also learn about how other countries are doing this. I've learned so much about how open education is um, administered um, in other countries. And that's been really valuable to me. Thank you so much, Denise. This looks wonderful. Um, can't wait to jump in there. All right, next up is James Clapper-Grosclag on stewardship of content and student data. Okay, thanks Unan, thanks everybody. Uh, after all of these very concrete uh, examples uh, uh, by my colleagues here, uh, uh, records and, and, and controlled vocabulary, we're gonna get, get a little, little bit more abstract uh, talking about stewardship. Uh, next slide, please. I had the great, great, uh, uh, honor and pleasure to work with these colleagues from all over the United States, uh, uh, predominantly in higher education and, and interestingly, uh, predominantly in, in community colleges or teaching teaching centric institutions. And I know, I think uh, Judith Sebesta and Nathan Smith are here as well today. So thanks guys for being here. And next slide. So uh, before we go any further, we have to think about what stewardship means. What do we mean by stewardship? Uh, stewardship is an ethic that embodies the responsible planning and management of resources, generally recognized as the acceptance or assignment of responsibility to shepherd and safeguard the values of others. So if you think about uh, us as open educators, working with content, working with artifacts of teaching and learning, working with knowledge in the public sphere, uh, I think quickly we can see that uh, stewardship uh, raises a lot of questions around what is an appropriate ethic, what is responsible, uh, what is uh, shepherding, and what is safeguarding. What what does all that mean? Uh, so we 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 uh, sort of puzzled over this quite a bit, uh, thought about it quite a bit, uh, but also we we came in our working group. We came to a couple of realizations pretty quickly. First of all, next slide, please. First of all, there exists a really uh, influential and thoughtful uh, document entitled The Care Framework, uh, which was published in 2018 by Lisa Petrides, Doug Levin, and Edward Watson that uh, sort of describes the uh, attributes of what a good steward is. If you wanna be a good steward, a good caretaker in open education, then you, you engage in the following behavior. You, you, uh, you contribute OER, uh, you contribute back to the field, right? You're, you're a giver, not just a taker. You attribute, you give credit, you practice conspicuous attribution. Uh, you release the material, uh, you or your organization, you release the material that you, you might have a hand in creating uh, to others, you know, just keep it for yourself. You don't hide it behind a, a learning management system, uh, for example. And, and finally, you empower others. You empower uh, different voices and perspectives to come into uh, the produ production of knowledge, right? So, 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 of course, that exists in the world that was influential. Uh, and secondly, we realized uh, pretty quickly in our conversation, the work group, <coughs> pardon me, that there are a number of, of, let's say, more contemporary or current issues uh, that really are animating us. Uh, questions around privacy and data and surveillance. Questions around uh, in so-called inclusive access uh, requirements for students to purchase content or lease content, and the lack of inf lack of informed consent 
that, that we in our institutions and that commercial publishers uh, permit students to exercise. So, so we were really uh, quite concerned about, uh, let's say, these, these more contemporary issues as well, and perhaps because we're, we're, most of us are working in higher education in the US, we're all concerned about contingent labor or adjunct labor and the uh, uh, lack, of, lack of participation or recognition uh, oftentimes. So, so uh, we, we agreed to uh, that the, the care framework, the existing care framework would make a good basis for uh, moving, moving our conversation on. We had the good fortune to be in dialogue with the original authors of the care framework who supported our work. They were very excited to know that people in the field wanted to iterate the care framework. So the, the final outcome is going to be perhaps a, a care framework 2.0 in collaboration with the original authors, or perhaps another document that, that, that is in, somehow in dialogue with the original care framework. At any rate, uh, the current questions that are, are focusing our attention are, are, are as follows here on the screen. Uh, first, around the question of labor, how do stewards, if you, if you or your organization want to be a good steward, how do you support and seek appropriate compensation and recognition for creators and collaborators? Uh, and secondly, uh, inclusion, if you <laughs> want to be a good steward, how do you encourage contributions by and support for voices of learners who have not been included in commercialized knowledge? Uh, third, privacy, how can you or we consider users' privacy and consider the data and surveillance practices of platforms that host OER. You know, uh, this is hashtag open washing, right? If, you, if, if my organization uh, utilizes a CC BY uh, license and thereby permitting bad actors in the commercial space to uh, lure users into their platforms uh, where they're subject to harm, is that really a good, is that really being good steward? So that this this really has me rethinking the kind of license that, that my organization uses, uh, and then finally consent. How do stewards? How do we promote learners' rights to exercise informed consent around artifacts and data? So uh, we've we've seen a great uh, infusion of work uh, at at this conference and at, at other conferences uh, in the field around uh, open pedagogy and co curation of content. Well. How are we respecting the rights of our students to give informed consent as to what happens to their content downstream? So those are those are the big questions that are animating our our conversation right now. And again, it'll come out as a either a um, uh, an iteration of the Care Framework 2.0 uh, or a, a, con a document that's in conversation with that. So with that, I'll turn it back to Liz and Una. Thank you so much, uh, James, um, for that um, introduction. And now um, we're going to ask all of you to choose a breakout room. Um, and um, each of our, um, our work group leaders have um, presented what their project is about. And you can go to the bottom of your screen, I believe, and you can see breakout rooms. Is everyone seeing the breakout room? Uh Thank you, Liz. Yes, thank you, Liz, for taking us over there and bringing us back. Um, and now I want to invite um, the team leaders, um, unless you unless you identified somebody in your group, um, to uh, share back a little bit about the conversations. And once again, just to keep this simple, I'm going to do it alphabetically. So I'm going to start with the policy group. Um, and Denise, would you like to share what went on in your room? It was a party. Um, we had a couple of people who um, um, are interested in um, institutional level policy. So we took a look at the um, the world map, um, and then um, yeah, we just talked about what the world map can do and what it contains um, for people who are working at all levels of um, open education. Great, great. Thank you, Denise, and. Um, Professionalism. Quill, how about your group? And if you I, want to share your screen, I, I can make that possible too. That is okay. So um, we talked about um, how people might use the matrix. I gave a brief tour of the, the matrix as it exists right now. Um, and we talked about um, 
kind of how useful it can be in, in its current iteration. And we talked about the needs for connecting um, and, and centralizing professional development opportunities for people who are new to the field. So it's less like I chanced into something and much more like I deliberately went and found the support resources I need to do my work. So any gaps identified in? Um... Yes, we did. For example, publishing an OER, which I knew I was like, oh, we need new people on our team. because <laughs> We didn't have any publishing people. Um, so yes, we've we've noted some gaps and we've also noted some interests. So I'm very excited about what we can do in the future. Well, that's great. Super. All right. And next up would be um, stewardship, I guess. Yep. <laughs> Alphabetically, James. Uh, yeah, well, I think the, the discussion was really, really fun, but I, I want to give uh, Judith Sebesta and Nathan Smith, also from the Arlo Group, uh, an opportunity to, to share their observations of the feedback. Judith Absolutely. or Nathan? If Judith doesn't jump on, I'll, I'll throw in. I just, I'll, I thought one of the great ideas we had was to include some examples uh, for each of these areas. And we, we're gonna work on that. And then the other thing I just to, would plug is that in the chat, I dropped a link to a Google form. So if you were listening to the stewardship and thought you might have some feedback on that um, section, um, if you would you know, take a few minutes to fill out that form, we're collecting responses as we keep thinking about these things. Great. That's pretty much what I was gonna say, Nathan. Thank you. Anything else, Judith? No. <laughs> okay. And in, in the chat, props from Quill for Nathan, who participated in, in two of the work groups. Yeah, I don't know how we did that, Nathan, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> he volunteered. I remember. <laughs> well, and, and I, I have to say, you know, in all of the introductory pieces, we did not acknowledge that that we were doing this work during the pandemic. And, you know, when the pandemic hit, you know, I, I, I remember back in, in the early spring, I think we were all, all of our work groups were set for, you know, the next meeting in March. And that was just intense for everybody. So yeah, thanks okay. to everybody who's kept going. <laughs> Those didn't necessarily happen. One thing I want to mention is, um, and Liz, maybe you can put this link in again. Uh, well, actually, we have a bit.ly for it. But please do contribute um, these resources and forms to the OEG Connect site. Um, and it's very simple to do it. Um, and um, I want to give Amy and um, Sunny a chance, Sunny a chance to speak as well. But it's that uh, that what I shared with you earlier, which was Bitly Arlo at OE dash OEG. That'll take you actually to this particular um, presentation in the schedule. And that's uh, please do share their comments or links. And sorry. Um, for that commercial. Um, Amy and Sunny, how, how did your group go? Um, I think um, I, I made it so that we needed more time <laughs> to talk <laughs> because I gave um, a tour that was a little bit too long, but um, we did have one person share um, a sustaining digital humanities resource that we hadn't previously known about, which was very helpful. Um, and we also had a um, question come up about where um, disciplinary professional associations fit in to um, sustainable OER initiatives. Um, so if folks want to continue in the chat or um, in some other way, that would be great. And I'm sorry for talking more in the tour than giving time for discussion. That's great. So the disciplinary um... Um, societies um, and sustainability. That's, um, yeah, that is, I think, a really interesting area. And someone brought up the concern that, you know, what happens if the, if the one OER advocate, perhaps working part-time, um, retires or moves on to another position, then what happens? And, and it's important to have these things uh, um, integrated into the institution. Yeah, really good. Exactly. Point. Thank you which I think uh, Denise's, uh, Denise, Denise's group on policy was talking about some of that work, making sure that it's embedded. All righty. Well, um, I wanna open this up for Q&A, but there were some wish lists that um, people put uh, in, the, um, in this particular area of sort of phase two, because we're finishing phase one. 
uh, as we speak. And um, phase two will start early in 2021. And um, so here are some really great ideas about phase two. Does anyone want to speak to that before we open this up for Q&A? Hi, um, it's Denise. Yeah. As I mentioned, um, it's it's helpful to work with another person when putting in um, documents into the policy hub. So I'm hoping to um, get some ambassadors um, from our group to work individually with state leaders to get their policies in. So we make sure that our everyone's using the same fields in the same um, in the same vocabulary. Um, we keep talking about control vocabulary. It's just a super important in a database and database development. So I'm hoping that's going to be one of my next steps. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, anyone else want to hone in a little bit more on their wish list? All right, and, and I'm sorry, I didn't wait the full 10 seconds <laughs> because we are coming up on the hour. Actually, we have eight minutes, but I would like to open this up to uh, people who have joined us today and um, you, know, you can unmute your, um, we don't have a particularly huge group. So I think we, uh, you can just unmute your microphone. Um, Liz, I hope that that's possible. And um, just um, speak up and um, ask questions. Or of course you can chat if that works better for you. Oh, Liz says we're already two minutes over time. <laughs> well, Liz, it said we had 60 minutes. <laughs> um, well, we need to get the next group set up. But um, we can, I'm going to put the link for OEG okay. Connect. So if you want to, if any of the um, co-presenters want to put any of those great links in there to share with people, and um, if you want to put a link to the slides, that would be great. Um, and also this, this recording will be put up there in it. Um, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you, Liz. I, I thought we had the full 60 minutes um, when I looked at the schedule, but... Bruna, right. the next group doesn't need much time to, to prep. You can you can take a few more if you need them. Do you start, you start though, at 10 o'clock, Dave? 11.10. We've got 15 minutes. You got 15 minutes. Okay. Um, Liz, if you need to stop the recorder, you can, but um, I welcome um, people... Um, ask questions or, or just comments. If you, you enjoyed the presentation, um, you appreciate all the hard work that this, these work groups have done over the last year. It's really been, um, it's, it's really been amazing. Um, and it's really taken a deep dive into these areas. I think we'd all like to thank you, Una, too, for the amazing work that you do and keeping us all well, together. Thank to, thanks to Liz and uh, as well, we've uh, we've enjoyed supporting you, and we're thrilled to see the outcomes from your groups. So thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today, and um, it was nice to meet all of you, and nice to see all of your shining, beautiful faces once again. <laughs>